ninety uh, percent value in future is going to be on the digital side. Uh, less than ten percent value is going to be on the physical, the tangible side. So it's extremely important that in India we start to look at that as well from everything from. whether we are talking about education we are talking about learning we are talking about how do we build the ecosystem uh and that's something that i'm been actually also trying to talk to uh the government and with art park we're trying to bring the whole academia industry and government together uh in a kind of like an open innovation network and uh, it's early days and i think we probably have a lot to do Right. to look at it very honestly but yeah i mean i mean th- there's no better time to start now thank you for joining the change i am possible which is india's first future tech meets sustainability podcast today i'm delighted and honored to have with me mr umakant soni who is transforming the the future tech deep tech movement here in india So it's it's a complete pleasure and honor to have you on, on on the show. So why don't we start with a small introduction and background on who you are, what you do, and what got you so interested in deep tech, artificial intelligence? Uh, and thanks, Ali, for inviting me here. Um, so what's the best way to describe me? I think the best way to describe me is summation of all errors uh, that I've made in the last twenty years. in terms of trying to build technology uh building products uh, investing now helping out in growing the ai ecosystem so i made lots of errors and i think uh, probably i am some of all those errors that's the best way to describe me uh <clears throat> and very quickly uh, a quick short intro i uh, graduated out of iit kanpur in 2001 uh spent early part of my career trying to learn how to build technology then uh you know came across a very interesting article by Ray Kurzweil which said that some of ai is going to be more than human intelligence and this was 2008 and uh, i actually read that article i was so moved that i resigned from uh, my, my first job which was at wipro we started india's first ai chatbot company in 2009 10 and uh, you know three really s- super smart guys uh, you know who were some of the best technologists in iit kanpur alumni network they came and worked with me and we built the technology but we couldn't sell it in india and that was uh, a very humbling experience because we realized that uh, <clears throat> you might build the best of the technology but if you don't have the ecosystem to support uh, you would not be able to create these unicorns and decacorns and you know bigger companies in that so i spent a year in valley and understood the power of the ecosystem and came back to india with a view to you know can we can we make a small you know change here and start building it brick by brick so uh, uh, you know myself and manish singhal we started pi ventures we raised 2 to 25 crores which is like a 30 million and we backed around 14 companies only focused on ai and i realized one thing that india always had the talent uh, you know 15000 of i you know iit alumni is are running silicon valley some of them have become ceo which become well recognized but if you don't build the ecosystem then the talent will migrate to where the best ecosystem is so if we build the best ecosystem and what do i mean by that uh, we, that means that we are able to create an ecosystem where we are able to allow talent to create cutting edge research translate it into products and eventually build the capital ecosystem to support once they start to become companies and the the founders and mentors ecosystem which is a peer learning network around it that is what i mean by ecosystem and uh, we we started in a little bit by creating art park ai and robotics technology park uh, promoted by industry science and uh, helped by half a billion dollars of investment by government of india under the national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical uh, systems uh, So we started in small ways. We have supported around 13 startups so far. Um, we have a whole bunch of people who have migrated back to India. Uh, you know, a lot of PhDs in robotics and AI was working with us, and uh, we are now setting up a, a hundred million dollar venture fund just focused on AI and robotics. So, so we feel that with this kind of ecosystem, we can truly extend the best help to. 
deep tech entrepreneurs in India. You somehow, I mean, have single and handedly played a role here in India to nurture and nudge the deep tech AI ecosystem because I do not see a lot of uh, other players who are uh, supporting the deep tech movement here in India. And you mentioned something extremely in uh, interesting in the beginning of the conversation. You, you mentioned that 90% of all economical value will be the in the digital space and 10% in the physical space. Maybe I, I would like you to unpack a little bit more about that, you know, because I, I think that's sure. that's a very, very interesting thing because there has been this Facebook, which is which had been a social media company, ha has rebranded itself and uh, to meta uh, and are leveraging the opportunity of the metaverse metaverse is the future of internet web 3.0 where we will move from the 2d to the digital uh, digital platform so would you like to unpack that 90 percent of digital sure. value so i think let, let's just move back a little bit right let, let's look at this year 1975 it's a very interesting year because in 1975 we had connected up to a billion places with rail, with road, with, uh, you know, connections through water. And that was the peak of the industrial economy. See, industrial economy, in a very layman's term, you were selling access production of one place to another place, right? That's the, that's a, that's the core of the industrial economy. If you cut to 2005, where we had connected up to like a half a billion people with email, with social media, with internet, the difference between 1975 and 2005, it's very interesting to look at because in 1975, the, the tangible assets of the whole economy, there were five times of the intangible assets. Okay. And if you cut to 2005, it completely reversed. So the tangible assets were one fifth of the intangible assets, right? Of course, the size of the economy actually grew many fold. And if you look at a slice, maybe like 20, 30, uh, that's where we see that the, the, the AI and robotics and the, we're, what we're going to create is what we call as the experience economy. Okay. So, so just take a look at Alexa, right? Like it gives you an experience of actually having a singer to yourself, right? You, you basically ask it to sing any song and it will sing, right? Uh, it can shop for you. It can, so it's almost like this personal digital assistant and that the experience of that is actually very interesting, right? So, so with, you know, 5 billion people that we are going to connect with 50 billion intelligent devices, we are talking about a connected universe of experiences. And we, we chose to call it this experience economy. And that's where we feel that the intangible part of the assets, which is all going to be in the digital domain, is going to be 90% of the value. Only 10% of the value is going to be the tangible assets like, you know, uh, what you, we see, you know, this mouse, this, uh, you know, all of that would be a very small part. And it's very important to understand. So if the intangible assets from 2005, which was like, you know, five times more, will become this massive number, which is nine to 10 X more, which is almost doubling of that size, that represents huge opportunity. And that's why Zuckerberg uh, is probably rebranded its company to say, okay, we're going to be meta. We're going to take part in this digital revolution. They might do digital currency. They might do many other things to profit from those experiences. Uh, but, but it is going to be fun, right? For sure. You mentioned that the basic thing that we need for to grow uh, uh, industry is the ecosystem. The ecosystem allows the talent to breed. Pi Ventures happens to be India's first and only AI focused fund. So would, would you like to talk a little bit about Pi Ventures and about the ecosystem, how we can, you know, create a sustainable and flourishing industry for AI and deep tech here in India? Absolutely. I think some of the things that you pointed out, one is that, yes, the need for this ecosystem and uh, at Pi, we raised almost uh, 225 crores. Uh, and large part came from government of India, uh, 55 crores through two fund of funds. And of course, some of the smartest uh, entrepreneurs in India, they backed us from Bini Bansal to uh, Mohan Das Pai to TK Korean to uh, uh, Girish uh, uh, Fresh Desk. Uh, and of course, uh, large uh, asset uh, managers like IFC, World Bank, CDC, 
um, and of course, uh, Munjal family, uh, they, were very, they were very gracious to actually give us money when we had no experience to show. And of course, uh, you know, a couple of companies are breaking through, which is great. Uh, there's an interesting company um, called Vaisa, which is applying uh, uh, mental health, uh, AI to mental health through chatbots. And uh, it's been very interesting because, you know, during COVID times, they had, you know, 400 million plus conversations. And uh, it's phenomenal that you know people are ready to uh, you know chat about their mental health issues uh, and of course it's a combination of uh, chatbots and human therapists but it, it is interesting to see people acceptance of that and uh, uh, so earlier if i were to look at maybe 10 years from you know now maybe in 2010 11 uh, we used to you know use this term chatbot very apprehensively because everybody used to say that hey you know uh, what is this chatbot, right? Why are you building a chatbot, right? And we were, of course, building chatbots as an entrepreneur to solve the support problems. And we built an emotionally responsive one right? in the sense that if the customer is frustrated, then it will actually respond to the uh, emotion in real time. And it was a big technology feat, but to actually see it being used at such scale is actually eye-opening. And that is the reason why, you know, we are building a much larger fund now in AI and robotics called Art Ventures, which is, of course, spawned up with Art Park. Uh, the, the, the key perspective that I want to talk about is the opportunity side, right? So if I were to look at maybe 10 years uh, back, the, the size of the digital opportunity was there, but this was much, much smaller, right? But now if we are talking about 90% of the value is going to be in, the, in this domain, the size is much, much bigger. So what we're going to see and, it, and it's important to actually have a peek into that because that will actually allow a lot of the young, talented entrepreneurs to focus their energies, right? So one part is going to be the foundational systems, right? I mean, metaverse, I don't think it's only meta who's going to do the metaverse. I think there are going to be many, many metaverses. And maybe somebody from India will build a huge metaverse. Exactly. Right? So, the so the tech for metaverse is here. Then we're talking about the digital twins, right? So you will actually see digital twins of everything, right? So whatever you see as a physical asset, you are going to find its digital twin, right? So everything will actually have the digital twin. So all the 5 billion people will also have their digital twin. That's a huge opportunity, right? Uh, and maybe uh, Facebook doesn't have to be the only one building those digital twins, right? Then the third thing that I see is the whole, so if you look at it, right? Only 1,000 plus engineers are creating you know, this iPhone, right? But on this iPhone, you have 60 million, uh, you know, uh, different kind of games or applications which are there, right? Now, it actually creates a lot more number of jobs because each of these apps or games require multiple number of people to actually create, right? So once you build a platform, on top of it to create this experience economy, we'll need multitudes of talent. And that's where, you know, we're, we're trying to play a small part there we realize that the human learning is going to be very core as to how we unlock you know people's uh, talent so in fact we're working very closely uh, we have a project called project eklavia where we're trying to redefine human learning because we feel that if we if we have 1.36 billion people and if we can teach them how to learn anything we would be unleashing a, a bundle of talent across and they could then go ahead and look at the opportunities and create, uh, you know, something that could create value for themselves and also for the large society. Probably in the digital economy, uh, the experience economy that we are talking about, India might be the land with its creative and uh, innovative insights. Uh, you know, they might be the ones who might actually be able to take a much larger share, provided we are able to invest in our people. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we so desperately need to invest in the people and there is a huge opportunity over there. I, I want to uh, I want you, you to talk about Art Park and Project Eklavia. But before that, I would want you to get into uh, the chatbot uh, that you mentioned. You mentioned about the emo emotionally responsive chatbot. Uh, you know, at this point, in a, most, most of the chatbots, I mean, uh, uh, are the data driven and it, we, we still in narrow stage of, of the artificial intelligence what are the capabilities when you talk about an emotionally responsive chatbot what can it do would, would you like to maybe unpack that 
Absolutely, and I think it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and of course, this was done long back. I mean, I'm talking about 2009-10 when deep learning wasn't there yet. And uh, you know, so we were actually doing this in the hard way, in the sense of there was no transformers at that point of time. So we had to literally build this, uh, and it was a very interesting way of approaching, where we would say that, hey, you know, uh, and this was for customer support. So you have to think from that perspective that, hey, I'm reaching out because I have a problem, and then you know I give you some answers. Now, if you're happy with my answer, then you might be you know irate or you might be unhappy to to begin with. But if I give you the right answer, then your tone might change. So we used to actually measure how the how, what is the emotional content of the message that's coming in, and what is the answer that is changing the emotional nature of the content. So or it could be that you might get super angry because I don't have answer for you, right? So in that way, we would actually escalate it to a human being. So this system was actually functioning really well. It's a very interesting uh, perspective. We call it Avatar Robotics. Uh, we, we are spinning it out as a company soon. Uh, so the idea is that you could actually have robots which will, you know, take skills and emotions across the boundaries. So this robot could be sitting with a patient in Japan and looking at, you know, what the distress is with respect to. Uh, you know, when she's going about, she's making facial expressions and uh, it is able to respond to her. And if uh, she feels that it, she needs more attention, then it will connect to a nurse in India and the nurse can appropriately guide, you know, the robot to actually take care of, uh, you know, the, the patient. Now, this is something very, very interesting because if we can allow this kind of system to be built and, you know, uh, then people don't have to migrate, right? I mean, Today, you would be so surprised, but every single country actually has an open visa system for nurses because there's a shortage of nurses. I mean, in fact, uh, last year, 30% of nurses in EU, they left the profession because, of course, of the hardships uh, that they had to undergo during COVID. So as the aging population in US and Europe, it's a huge opportunity. And it's not just in nursing. We see that, you know, there could be a person sitting here. He could be moving lawns and... Uh, in New Zealand, or maybe watching farms in Australia, or maybe uh, driving a truck in 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 Sweden in the North uh, Nordics, right? It's very cold out there, without having to migrate. So what we feel is the next evolution of technology is that to carry the understanding of skills and emotions across the boundaries, and uh, and we feel that that's actually going to happen more and more as we start to get more and more sensors embedded into things around us, they will actually understand us way better than human beings in some cases. We are sensorizing the world, you know, and these, these robotics, you know, with these sensors, these cameras, the, the kind of data that they're going to collect. And then there's IOTs, you know, and you said mentioned digital twin, you know, we, we, we are digitizing the physical world. You know, IOT is going to be like, I mean, everything is going to be digitized from my potty seat to my glasses to, to yeah, obviously wearables to anything and everything. So we're getting into an exciting world. I, I, I wish and I hope that the, the ecosystem understands the opportunity here in India and starts leveraging it you know i mean would you like to uh, before we get into art park would you talk, like to talk about the portfolio companies at, at pi ventures and how have they grown post their investment and partnership with pi ventures so i think there was a very interesting company called nirmai uh, uh, it's a company that is uh, doing some really fundamental stuff uh, they they use thermal images to identify breast cancer super early right so so it's, it's a scary statistics, but uh, two out of, uh, I mean, uh, one out of two women who get identified with breast cancer in India, they die because it gets detected very late, right? And uh, and this is as compared to one in six in Europe or US, right? Where there is a regular checkups are being done, right? And why don't they do it? Because, you know, of course, it's a social stigma because some, you know, usually the, uh, you know, the, uh, the person who's doing it is male and, and uh, they press the breast and they scan it and it can be a very painful process as well, right? So nearby came up with a very interesting way in which they would take thermal images so nobody sees uh, the breast which is in a very intimate uh, uh, part of the human body and nobody touches it. So, it's, so they just scan it with thermal images and now for thermal images it's kind of very interesting because uh, each dot represent 
an RGB value and that represent a, a, a very highly sensitive understanding of the temperature, right? So instead of actually capturing uh, the density, which is typically done with X-ray, they are actually uh, mapping it even earlier because every kind of uh, tumor generation starts with abnormal blood flow. So there is abnormal blood flow to a particular cell and that will manifest into a tumor later on. Oh. So they are capturing it, the abnormal blood flow. And it's a very sophisticated algorithm. They've got now C marking the certified and it is very heartening to know they've got the clinical trials done. Uh, they've proved that, uh, you know, this is working. And now they're expanding in uh, outside India as well, right? There's another company called Locus, um, which is applying AI to logistics. Uh, you know, now they are across, I think, four continents. Uh, they just recently raised a $50 million round uh, as a substantial valuation. Um, so what we have seen is something very interesting, that AI grown in India, because of the variety of data sets that you find around problems. India is a supermarket of problems. We have all kinds of problems. And we have data about all kinds of problems. We have problems in, you know, uh, healthcare, like like if Nirmay were to start in Europe, right? Because they are not, they're, they're screening it so frequently, they'll not find data about all kinds of, you know, tumors. But in India, they do. And once they create a robust solution because they've got all kinds of data, they can then take it to, you know, US, Europe, Japan, everywhere. It was very interesting. I was actually in uh, in Switzerland and they showed me, They were uh, and I was meeting Swiss Post uh, and they, they told me that they're using an Indian company to, you know, help manage the, the postal delivery. I mean, of course, Switzerland is supposed to be the, you know, the punctuality uh, gods in some sense. And, uh, and that company happened to be Locust. And that was really, really interesting that, you know, here is an Indian company leveraging some of the most cutting edge advanced tech. And it has actually proved himself to the, one of the most stringent customer in, in Europe. And uh, so that is something that we are seeing consistently where, you know, company grown in India with vast amount of data are able to have very robust AI solutions. And then you can take them global. So what we feel is that, and this, in fact, the new fund, $100 million venture fund that we are creating, we want to actually accelerate that part where we feel that the new technology decacons out of India are going to come in this fashion where they are lab grown in India. And then once they become big, they can actually travel across the globe. Right. So just to give you a perspective on it, maybe Tesla grown in Silicon Valley would get stuck in Silk Board in India. But if we have an autonomous car that is able to prove successful on Indian roads, it will definitely work in Europe and US as well. Right. I, I was just about to touch that point, you know, because I think you raised a very important point about the variety of data sets available here in India. 1.4 billion people, you know, the, the population and and we are uh, every day the digitized population is growing. You know, the data that's being collected can be so awesome you know it can create awesome solutions you know you know right from your autonomous vehicles to healthcare solutions to personalize education so i'm super excited about the space that we are getting into and we need to build a cohesive community and ecosystem with support system such as yours which is leveraging the government the academia and industry to to accelerate and push this e ecosystem forward so so wish you the very best on, on this journey Art Park, do talk about that and what's his vision and what's its ro the role play or the future of India. Absolutely. So while we're investing with companies uh, with Pi and we've invested in a few of them, we realized that if I look at the ecosystem in Israel and China, or of course in US, there are the, the number of companies that we found and the varieties of companies that we found there was staggering. And especially in you know AI and robotics. And we realized that there is, you know, something which is, you know, hugely missing here. And I went back to Niti and Government of India, Meiti, because they had given us, uh, you know, so much funds. And I said that, hey, there is something that we need to do here. And of course, uh, to do DST uh, and, uh, you know, helped out a little bit in, you know, the AI strategy for India, uh, which Niti came out with a landmark paper. I, th I thought that was very, very 
forward thinking perspective on AI, uh, where they talked about AI for all. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I was so proud that, you know, India is actually taking that stance is saying that AI can be for the sustainable future of the world. And it should be an inclusive future. And that was a great perspective and uh, worked very closely with uh, uh, DST, Department of Science and Technology to, uh, uh, you know, so that we could actually, uh, and they finally uh, came out with a mission called uh, National Mission on Interdisciplinary Cyber Physical Mission, which is investing half a billion dollars into AI research and innovation ecosystem. Because while we are producing great talent, right, the talent doesn't get any place for it to try the cutting edge in technology or research, right? So the research translation wasn't happening. So we had talent coming out of all the IITs, but there was no place where they could actually take the research and translate it into product companies. So that's where, you know, with this investment, we set up, you know, AI and robotics technology path. Uh, we exceeded it with initial grant of uh, close to $32 million from DST and also from government of Karnataka. Uh, and we promoted it together with Indian Institute of Science. And uh, so the future that we see is that it has to be an inclusive and it has to be equitable in the sense that the fruits of AI and robotics revolution have to be spread evenly. Otherwise, it will actually spawn more inequality. I think the largest problem we as humanity are facing it is inequality, the deep, deep divide. Capitalism has created a world where 1% of the global population owns 90% of the entire global wealth. And the inequality is growing, at least, you know, with technology, I see that I was just reading recently, there's this company called Ravi, Ravi Vicor, which is United uh, Biotherapeutics. And they recently did a xenotransplantation uh because organ shortage is, is is a huge problem you know we, we humans face so they genetically modified a pig organ to fit into a, a, a human so th this was done recently because this was helped done because of technology but this is really 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 expensive and it's only for the privileged few then we're talking about augmented reality virtual reality mixed reality education where education can go for all or artificial intelligence personalized education again really really expensive because when you're talking about virtual reality you need these virtual reality headsets which itself is the cheapest one is 38 to 40 thousand and artificial intelligence i mean you know you personalize education that's just for the rich class so when you're saying that ai for all sustainable inclusive equitable future taking the technology to a billion people what's the roadmap or the plan I think it's a very important and pertinent question you talk about. And let me take you uh, one perspective. When the COVID wave two hit, right, and we saw the stark difference. In fact, um, at that point of time, we were running a very interesting experiment with uh, Nirmay and Indian Institute of Science, uh, where we had developed a model which could identify the state of lung health, right? And we packaged it in a form where, you know, it, it was available to everyone using WhatsApp. Right, so uh, we we called it X-ray Setu, and uh, so what it did was like it opened up, uh, you know, for doctors and X-ray technicians in rural areas that they could actually access really sophisticated help. Uh, they could take a picture of the X-ray, or if they already had a picture, they could send it to a number through the WhatsApp. It, it was a chatbot, and they will get a full report uh, back. Right. And when we launched that, and we saw that actually, and we were flooded with, you know, people sending pictures, and you know, and and this this came from you know places like Baramati Taluka, right? And we spoke to the person, and we we asked him that okay, what we could have done better? He said, and he said one very interesting thing. He said that if you'd actually released it, you know, a couple of months earlier, I could have saved so many lives because they don't have radiologists. Imagine that. You know, 85 crore people who live in rural areas, they have access to hardly 1,000 radiologists. It got used by across 28 countries. Very simple tool. We released it. We said that, you know, we need to do something for the wave two. We need to help out in any way. And it has been used uh, more than 10,000 times. And more than that, what we saw was very, very interesting. We saw that if you are born in a place like Bangalore or, you know, places where health and care infrastructure is better, your chances of surviving 
a disease like covid was way higher than probably a village in uttarakhand where just to do an rt pcr test you have to travel like 30 40 kilometers forget about x ray uh, you know uh, or uh, mri scan or uh, or so the ct scan which was the norm that people were doing ct scans so we have to figure out a way in which we are able to bring healthcare to people's doorstep in fact there is a huge program that we are trying to run we call it the digital intelligent healthcare ecosystem where we are trying to reimagine the healthcare system for india we are thinking that we need to move away from the provider centric model primary secondary tertiary i mean as a person i don't care whether i'm going to a primary healthcare or secondary healthcare or third i don't even know which hospital is a primary or a secondary or tertiary what i need i need well being i need uh, early diagnosis i need care workflow i need follow up and i need surveillance of what's actually going to come next for me to prevent another pandemic to happen and this is very very important and critical as a nation if you are not able to benchmark our healthcare with respect to what is available in a village we probably are fooling ourselves and we have to do it at, at a price point which will make it affordable for us right and that's why we where we need to innovate all across in terms of how do we integrate our traditional medicines with which which are great at you know the wellness and you know preventive part of it i think they have been practiced from a centuries there is so much of data that is there we have not unpacked it and we have not integrated that and what if we build a peer learning network so we actually did two batches of kids in project eklavya where we actually got them together and we realized that there is a new way to approach learning and in fact now we are enlarging that in collaboration with university of alto uh, helsinki uh, you know finland they are the leaders in uh, you know human learning part and we said okay great you have like you know what uh, maybe 3 <clears> 4 million uh, you know people it's okay you can uh, you know scale that approach but what about when you actually have 300 million plus kids right uh, how do you scale that approach can we can we really understand Uh, because you know we, when we are you know watching how ai is learning and ai is learning rapidly right so we see self supervised learning that's the way to go right we don't have any equivalent of that in our schools today right there is no way a, a, a kid when he wants to learn he has access to resources and he can learn by himself he can be the eklavya right so in that respect there is no place where peer learning is encouraged in schools in colleges right in fact as young professionals or as we get older the we don't go to schools anymore we learn from peers like i'm learning from you what you're doing exciting stuff and you know we are you're probably learning something what we are trying exactly. to do with ai so why don't we institutionalize it in our schools so we are actually creating a learning lab uh, leveraging the nep the new education policy that's coming up uh, and this is a 3000 square feet lab which is the model of we call it the school for ai age and it's it's embodying that how do you do you know self learning how do you do peer learning and how do you contextualize your learning by project based learning and it's a completely space architecture so the physical space is different and also what goes along with it and we are teaching kids to become creators so whether it is physical creation or digital creation that is what is going to be rewarded in this experience economy that's going to actually unfold and that's why it will be very interesting uh, to actually collaborate with uh, what you're doing in vr and can we bring that to kids because you know they are the future so i mean 2030 when you know the ai driven experience economy is going to be starting to hit its peak they would be adults they would be driving it so we need to get them ready for the future so we are trying to see how can we take you know healthcare education and mobility and take it to billions and how do we spawn new products new technologies new business model new companies to take advantage of this democratization of access to resources which is i feel is very very fundamental lovely lovely wish you the very best uh, because you're doing so many things and, and your x-ray setu and the education space and and i think you know we need to reimagine everything rather than uh, approaching it with a bandaid solution because the world is moving so fast and, and these technologies or tools are giving us the opportunity to correct the wrongs that we have created with all our systems you know i mean with 
blockchain with decentralized uh, 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 how we can create a decentralized world you know cryptocurrencies where we could maybe correct uh, finances or you know create programmable money uh, ar vr mr where we could create a uh, uh, a democratized education healthcare where you, you mentioned you know you could even if you're sitting in a rural place you know you could have uh, the same qual- uh, quality of education which which a privileged person gets sitting in 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 the city so so you are the advisor for sweden india business council and and you are creating a deeper relationship and engagement between the both both of the countries yeah. us canada is, is leading but then there is this china which is doing some amazing things you know when it comes to future technologies right from quantum computing to virtual reality to artificial intelligence to iot autonomous vehicles they are right out there but somehow because of the friction that uh, the the uh, or political system has created there seems to be lack of engagement between both of our countries do you see a, a, a importance of us creating relationships with china and you know or, or the entrepreneurs startup community over there yeah i think it, i mean of course it depends upon whether they want to create a dialogue or not right uh, but having said that there are a few things that we should learn from china i think one is that definitely uh, the way they build their uh, you know the core ecosystem of talent capital research uh, <clears throat> i think that was very very fundamental and they did it so right uh, and and there is a power in building these open innovation networks right and maybe we need to do it with countries which are a lot more willing to share right so sweden is one of them so so they have a culture of building uh, or uh, you know uh, you know things and products we've been great at engineering things and uh, i think it is important to learn from them right uh, there are a lot of technology especially in clean tech and some of the advanced areas they are actually quite proficient they also have a very professional approach to research right and in fact before this conversation started i was actually talking to somebody in sweden and i was actually talking about like okay why research there is so professional because you know the largest families uh, the business families they donate up to 80% of their profits back into research wow. and uh, maybe somehow we want to bring that kind of culture there so i think there's lots to learn from the world uh, when we say atmanirbhar bharat we don't have to be isolated we i think we should learn from everyone and that includes china as well um, uh, and we should learn to bring in the best practices whether it is about how do you fund research how do you manage wealth how do you create talent how do you grow these companies and uh, of course the world is a market if you actually have a better product i mean you would be able to reach out to the you know whole world if my listeners who would like to reach out to you where can they re- reach out to you and who would you want to reach out to you you know because would would there be entrepreneurs startups because what kind of companies are, are you looking out for absolutely so if you're dreaming of electric sheep definitely reach out to us uh if you're crazy about ai and robotics revolution you want to transform the society you want to you know build a better future for all of us please uh, if you are uh, a technologist specializing in ai and robotics i mean we are building an awesome team and culture at art park please do write to us uh, uh, umakant at artpark.in uh, you can just drop me an email you can check out the website uh, it's all all out there uh, and we are supporting tons of entrepreneurs startups uh, companies so art park is a confluence of uh, academia industry and government uh, to kind of like drink the water together so it's a watering hole uh, you know now in this virtual world it doesn't have you don't have to be in bangalore you can be anywhere and can be a part of us so please reach out to us uh, we have a extensive program called art park innovation program for startups entrepreneurs you could join that in uh, if you are a large company you could actually create uh, labs uh, together with us with your csr funding we can take in csr funding and fcra grants as well uh, if, if you are government of course you can work with us because we are looking at partners who could take these solutions out uh, for the benefit of the society so yeah so if you are any one of them please do reach out to us thank you and wish you and your team the very best my last question to you what is your vision for an ideal india and how do you think we can get there 
yeah that's a good question it's an important question and i think the india actually has a very unique role to play in this ai driven experience economy i feel that us model is a interesting model where they have large monopolies you have china as a model where you know you have different kind of monopolies uh, you know where you're talking about maybe semi autonomous human beings in the uh, in the hands of autonomous machines i think india would be the place where semi i mean autonomous machines would work and coexist together with autonomous people and that's a dream that i have for india that we would be you and me adi all of us have to probably come together to build that probably i feel that if that model gets adopted across the globe it might be a better earth as well lovely wish you the very best and wish the dream comes true and yes i think india is in such a awesome time space and time there is so much opportunity the plus point about uh, china which it's a communist nation there is everything is uh, shrouded whereas india you know we are free to do what we want we encourage an open innovation and, and there is no building blocks and, and and so i see that india has a bigger future to play and and, and that future can come true when people like you and the government and academia and industry joins together in that note to my listeners if you like what you see in here please press the subscribe button and until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you thank you thanks adi pleasure talking to you take care yeah.